Okay, so self-care starts with breakfast. We eat oatmeal for breakfast every morning. In two years, that is 730 bowls each. If I don't get into the house and walk every day, I will go totally stir crazy. I'm at the corner of Queen and John pretending that I've just collapsed. And now the previous time that I did it, nobody stopped. We're gonna give humanity another chance with this one. Let's see what happens. Yeah, that's maybe why it's hard to talk about community care, because you can end up looking like an asshole. <laughs> when I was a kid, my idea of self-care was hiding when I was injured or sick. I mean, what does it really mean to take care of yourself and others when everything falls apart? All right, um, first of all, thank you to Wavelengths for having us, um, Johnny, Dave, um, Guillermo, and everyone else involved in putting this speaker series together. Um, so we've been curated to have a conversation centered around notions of care. Um, and, and we don't know each other that well, <laughs> you know, through only through brief correspondences by email. Um, you know, admittedly, I've done some research on you and your music. Googling. Prior to, <laughs> yeah, Googling, right? <laughs> prior to this chat. But I, I don't really think these like bio lines or these, you know, YouTube clips or these clips of your music, which by the way is like really incredible, um, enliven who you are. So I was, I, I think that maybe the, the most caring and careful place to start uh, would would be for me to ask how you're doing, like how's your day, and you know what's going on. Amazing. My day is awesome, and um, I, uh, I I I am healthy. I am alive. There's a roof over my head. I am eating a bowl of fruit. I cannot. Mm. I just came back from home, and uh, mm -hmm. the 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 uh, the very deep and important trip that I want also to to always share with my children is that to understand the. The, the 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 privilege we have when we live on these these these, these territories that we are on and uh, mm -hmm. how lucky we are and we always it's so easy to forget and get so wrapped up in your artistic world and that the, the 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 how life how hard your life can be but it just takes one little reminder of like how unbelievably lucky you are mm -hmm. so I'm great i'm doing great no matter how hard it is i'm doing great that's good i'm glad i'm really yeah. glad that you're doing Okay. How was your day? Oh, thank, thanks for asking. I mean, I'm good. I'm good. It's it's dark and it's rainy in Toronto today, and you know it's it's hard to it's hard to feel you know uh, not excited, but you know the, the weather definitely has an impact. But you know I'm healthy. My family is healthy, um, and you know we are uh, you know secure in our house, and we have stable jobs, and you know. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of things working in our life that um, make me feel good and make me feel uh, full of hope. So yeah, thank you for asking. We, I shared a really good bowl of fruit salad with my son yesterday on our porch uh, when the sun was shining and, and that felt like a pretty perfect moment. So yeah, yeah. we shared a good bowl of the uh, fruit salad. What's the temperature in Toronto right now? Pardon me? What's the temperature in Toronto right now? Um, let me double check. I mean, we're there's like a, like a rainstorm right now, and it is. Uh, oh no, my weather app isn't working. It's negative. It must be negative something. It it's it's definitely cold. I know that where you are is cold as well. Um, it's not so bad today. No. Um, it's like minus five, I think. Which mm -hmm. 
which is uh yeah it's still a lot colder than where we came from so <laughs> yeah i mean it's funny how we're like oh minus five is not that bad but it's still minus like it's still minus. it's so still bloody water cold. Bloody freezing outside and yeah. that's just terrible for you know? sure um <laughs> I mean, Wavelength was kind enough to give us some questions to, you know, uh, structure our conversation. And, um, you know, I guess a good place to start would be for us to chat about, you know, what community care means to us. You know, care is such a huge word. And, you know, I think this moment that we're in um, of explicit attention to war and racialized violence and things like that, um, care takes on a lot of different dimensions. So uh, maybe we can start with uh, what community care means to us and, and just see where our conversation goes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, community care is so many things. Uh, 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 you and I don't know each other, but mm -hmm. uh, immediately by the, the, the moment we started conversing via email, we automatically become a community, right? That's immediately that there's this connection of like that there's we are going to meet and we are going to converse have a conversation exchange ideas and uh, that immediately to me like, like that's it we are friends now by virtue of just having this opportunity and then asking one another about each other's lives and even before we hit recording we were talking about even the email about children and travel and 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 how everything is going and stuff and it's like genuine care about how everybody around you is doing at all times and and of course community care over the last especially over the last two years has taken on you know a, a very a much larger meaning um uh with with everybody really trying so hard to always you know keep others in mind it's it's, it's you know trying to keep everybody in mind um and and and, and I, I am lebanese i am from lebanon and i just came back from the trip we're talking about is i did go to lebanon with my family and to see a lot of all the friends who are still in lebanon post post absolute uh um shoot what's the shoot in english um crash the mm -hmm. collapse collapse the absolute collapse of, of of lebanon as a country uh economically politically uh in <laughs> every single physically the physical physical collapse of it of course uh and yeah to be to be there and, and just be very very uh feel very uh hopeful and uh, realize just the, the strength of community and the strength of people um you know people who are stuck there and cannot leave there because of political reasons um mm -hmm. just the community they have around themselves and to go there and be like very very refreshing reminder of of you know as bad as it gets uh, human spirit you know uh, always will always triumph which is cheesy as it sounds what i'm saying it sounds like a bad film but it really so it's so 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 true mm -hmm. i mean i like how you say this uh, how you bring up this idea of like the collective or like um you know uh, being concerned about how everyone is doing and i think you know concern for how everyone is doing doing is so loaded in in the term community and care for me. And I think that, you know, it's such a big concept that for me, like a good place to start trying to understand it is separating the words and, and really thinking about what community means to me and what care means to me and how these two words interact. You know, um, like you were suggesting that community describes, I think how people are bound together or how um, people are made sense of, whether that's through how, uh, someone self-describes or through social prescription, you know, or how we're made sense of by others, right? Um, so, you know, someone may say that I'm part of the LGBTQ community or I'm a part of the Toronto music community. And, you know, um, you have to be honest, I, like I've always felt a bit of unease with being named a part of um, something that feels much messier than the sense of belonging uh, that I think the word community implies. And yet I think I'm, I'm, I'm still so hailed by this word because it implies belonging, right? And I always want to belong. So, you know, there's a bit of ambivalence there around the term. Um, but I think the pandemic has really helped me to put into focus you know, a, a network of friends and family um, that are an essential presence in my life. And, 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 you know, maybe community to me as I'm working it out with you now is about intimacy. It's about uh, reciprocity. It's about loyalty. It's about uh, care. Um, and maybe, and, 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 and you, maybe you can help me flesh this out a bit is, 
you know, maybe it's better that these terms are always unfolding, that we shouldn't be able to pin them down so easily or define them so easily that we should be negotiating their meanings um, all the time so that they yeah. are indeed full of meaning, if that makes any sense. I mean, sense of belonging, I mean, this is, that's like, uh, whoa, massive, massive topics, my goodness. I know, uh, so big, right? <laughs> so big because it's so layered and so complex. Mm -hmm. I have my, my, my instinct, instinctually, I do not want to belong to mm -hmm. anything. I don't mean that like, oh, I think I don't belong here. It's not even that. It's more mm -hmm. like, in, in, like my instinct is always to be like, yeah, you know, that thing is there and I like to observe it from the outside. And if that's what you feel you are, that's great you know, absolutely awesome and, and, and great. Uh, but for me, it's like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I never feel, I just always feel like it's like, you know, a, a little ship and it's just sails on its path and does its thing. And at some point it's going to hit an iceberg and sink. And that's that. Uh, and when I, when I use the word community, it literally just means anybody to me who, like anybody that <laughs> I'm on a first name basis with. Well, that mm -hmm. to me community can be as much like your, your neighbor from three houses down can be your community because you've never been in their house and you only know them by virtue mm. of sitting outside when they're taking out the recycling and they say hi to your children and you say hi to their pet and uh, mm. that immediately becomes your community you know if they see you limping they're going to ask you how are you are you okay you know they're not going to mm. be like oh hey and pretend like you're normal if you're like bleeding you know something like that like that stuff is so like the, the notion of community can be as as vague as that or as as, as even vaguer than that is that you know i i i I'm asking how you are, not out of politeness. I'm asking because I'm mm -hmm. genuinely want to know how you are doing, you know? And mm -hmm. that, that to me is an immediate community. It's like, there is a connection. There's a line, a dotted line going from this person to that person. Mm -hmm. and that, that, that is community. So for me, it's like, it's, it's au-delà. It's like, it's much, much, it's broader than that. And it's, it's, and it's ever evolving. You're saying it's like not one thing. It's just what you decide it to be, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and I love that idea. I, I love that you at any moment can decide you are you belong to this community and at the same moment later you can be like actually I don't like this community and that's fine all that is totally yeah. percent okay and fine yeah or you know you know being being associated with a community uh, may not fit right like the ways in which we're named as part of communities may not be you know a, 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 an easy label to wear and and so like what are the ways in which communities connect but also disconnect us and you know um yeah. like it happens all the time in 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 this thing we call music <laughs> absolutely absolutely i mean and and maybe we can like talk about like what we think care means like these are such huge words and you know like obviously they're entangled with one another um in ways and like you've you know gestured to how you know like the asking of how one is 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 a gesture of care, right? Is is a is a is a way of articulating concern for another. And you know, I you know, there are ways in which care has been understood conventionally as like meeting basic needs like food, water, things like that, housing, and um, and how those needs are connected to social relations and the things that are needed to facilitate those needs. But you know, I, I'm I think for me, care is like that's not enough, you know, that like the meaning of basic needs is not enough for me. And yeah. and I think care is like about the collective, is about, you know, action, is about uh, translating an emotional mm -hmm. register or a feeling and thinking about the implications of who gets care for and who doesn't get care for, right? Um, and so, you know, it's also about, and like, if I'm rambling, please like put a, you know, pause on me because I know that, you know, sometimes I need some help with structuring my thoughts. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think there's like a, this relationship between care and complicity. Oh, no. I'm sorry, I missed your last like 30 seconds. Oh, you no, I froze. <laughs> you know, you know, you know who doesn't care about us? The internet, right? The connection, <laughs> these types of things. Anyway. <laughs> I guess, uh, I, I, where, where did I, where did I get cut no, off? I think, I think, I don't think I missed 30 seconds. I think it was just 10 seconds and I panicked and it felt like 30. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I, I was talking about, um, like how there's like there, I read somewhere about this like relationship between, um, care and complicity. Um, I think the author's name is Christopher Cutts or something. And he talk, talks about how, 
we should be thinking about how our own willful participation in activities and behaviors, how they might cause harm to others, right? And so I think that like when I think about care, I'm 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 thinking about how we are implicated in the suffering of others. And like and and I'm taking that really broadly, right? So yeah. like for me, care is an ethic um, that's tied to you know thinking about who doesn't get cared for. Like in like we're we're think we're in a moment where there's so much attention to war, but war has been, as you know, as you know, of course, like going on already. And so like what makes us care in this moment more than others, right? And it, like, uh, it just gets uh, an amazingly interesting topic because uh, it's it's uh, uh, being being social media creatures that we are mm -hmm. very uh, it's it, it's for someone like me and mm -hmm. this judgment. I mean, it is a judgment. I can't say it's not a judgment because that's hypocritical. But it is it is with trying to contain that judgment, but like mm -hmm. just seeing how how uh, uh, the dialogue around current uh, uh the current situation in 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 ukraine uh mm -hmm. is unfolding and how people take that information take that data and um uh, and uh, uh decimate decimate <laughs> oh my god i'm quite tired and jet lag how what's the word i'm looking for disseminate Decimate, disseminate it, <laughs> and then just disseminate it. Uh, uh, the use of the language, and that's it's, it's it's actually strangely very. What you're saying is quite accurate because in this act of care, we are also mm. completely ignoring, or the action in of itself becomes uh, destructive because it it that care does hurt other people. That action, mm. not it's mm. not wholly good. And wholly positive because within mm. that wholeness comes comes a negative. There is negative, and that we don't see that, understand that, recognize that is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to avoid that, of course, but the mm -hmm. ability to have the, the blinders on and not to be able to see that it's quite quite uh, quite uh, quite difficult. A person posted uh, the other day something that somebody who I consider you know somebody who I think is extremely intelligent and very sensitive person, but did mm -hmm. post something that I found so incredibly offensive like mm. so hurtful uh something to the lines of like um it's been three days and i cannot believe only only uh, a handful of my friends have been posting about this war in ukraine and that just really like struck me as like only a person with privilege would come up with something as 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 uh, as hurtful as that as hurtful mm -hmm. as that to say because what does that say about you? That that this this conflict, all that to me, it's it tells me that this conflict somehow has all all the right uh, the the right all the right guns, the media guns fired and hit their target in this person's psyche, and therefore this mm -hmm. person is so genuinely and understandably and as they should be very affected, horrified by it, and they're so shocked, mm -hmm. and feeling so helpless that one way to express this helplessness is to turn it around and be like oh my god this is what's happening in the world even though of course everybody within this person's feed obviously knows what's going on mm -hmm. but then that just tells you that that their, their degree of shock that nobody else around them not enough people around them are mobilized to talk about this and you're like do you not understand that that is you that you are that person for all these other conflicts like do you not understand yeah. you're talking about yourself when you talk about that because your feed doesn't usually talk about all the million other <laughs> conflicts happening at any given moment right. in, in our right. world. For me, that's that's the part that becomes very difficult. And that is such a North American thing for me. That's such a North American attitude about mm -hmm. how you perceive uh, 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 atrocities around the globe. And they're only, mm -hmm. only, only perceived when they sort of fit fit a media narrative that 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 falls in line with what your politics are somewhere vaguely. And outside mm -hmm. of that, you empathize kind of very peripherally and then within two, three, four, five days, we'll move on, you know? And yeah. I just felt like I felt like writing this person, I'd be like, I'd love to know what you think about the war in Ukraine in about six months. I'd love to know how much you're posting about this yeah. in six months, you know? That, that, yeah. That's such a mean thing to say. It's my immediate thought because it's just like, we are, we are, we are, we're trained at this, at the world's empathy for a minute and then, yeah, we'll move on to the next, the next trending yeah. topic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I think you're really touching on on this idea of care is like politicized, right? It's like politicized terrain. And, you know, like you, I'm interested in how care is distributed based on, um, am I cutting out? Is it okay? No, no, Everything's you're okay. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in thinking about how care is distributed based on whiteness, right? <laughs> or on one's proximity to whiteness, right? We see this playing out so explicitly on, on social media with the mass migrations of Ukrainian people who, uh, and who is being led into nation states to take refuge and who's being barred entry, who's being denied refuge, the ways in which, you know, these stories are circulating on social media, you know, a, a politics of care is animated when there's so much public outrage over this war and not the continued disenfranchisement of Palestinian people, for example. For example, right, and so you know there are ways in which this pandemic has, you know, created this heightened global attention from a Western perspective, of course, to you know injustice uh, connected to capitalism, racism, poverty, et cetera, et cetera. But you know we still have to you know um, think about the, the politics of care and who gets cared for within these narratives, right? And, and I think you've touched on that so well because you know war of course brings out uh, these slippery empathies that we see online right and, and this idea of like who are you going to pay attention to in a couple of yeah. months like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's not as if these wars are like ending <laughs> or these like these wars it's, have are persisting right like <laughs> of course of course it's just it just drives me crazy that you know where was your outrage? Where is your outrage, you know, in, in, in Chechnya? Where is your outrage in Crimea when it happened? Where was your outrage in Georgia when that happened? All these are Putin. All these are the same. We're talking about the same apparatus, the same human beings, the same snake, that same devil. And it just drives me crazy just how, how we just, we just, we, we are eating out of like the American agenda. We're out of the palm of the American agenda. And, and yeah, fuck Putin, fuck him to fucking hell. Like, I, you know, of course. But at the same time, it's just like, yeah, you know, it's not, it's, yeah, yeah, we're saying the same thing. To me, it's, it's very problematic. It's very, it does, it, it comes from an honest place, but it's just, there's a lot of ignorance around it. And that to me is hugely, mm -hmm. hugely problematic. And the bigger problem is the lack of acknowledgement of the ignorance around it, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, and is that outrage there for black and brown people? You know, like, like there is like such a deeply racialized um, dynamic going on. And, you know, if, if with the, the news, of that video that was circulating somebody that edited all the all the uh, all the news reporters who were talking about you know the initial wave of 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 um everybody who was fleeing all the ukrainian cities and how you know there were the, the the you know i'm talking about that like string of of the cnn reporters mm. abc reporters and how they were like oh, talking right. about how, how my god ukraine is so civilized this shouldn't be happening here this isn't afghanistan this isn't iraq and stuff like that mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like and it's just this like and people and then and then your your crowd of like your your sort of like community that are outraged by this and put it on there and then you're just like you always feel like do you not understand that 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 narrative exists because you are the target of it like you as yeah. a person have ex like you think this is new that this is how they talk about us this is new that, that this is how they talk about all the arab you know, uh, migrants who live in Ukraine, you think this is like, this is, th this is new to you, but like, welcome to the fucking, like, welcome to today, like, welcome to the fucking here and now, this has been going on forever, and this is what we've been talking about forever, it's just only now, it, 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 it's, yeah, again, it's just like, you're like, directing people's like, you know, like, just look here, please, just no, keep focusing here, keep focusing here, and you focus on that, and then the conversation's becomes so uncomfortable and that's why to me it's just like i just cannot have these conversations with any of my friends about this it's just, mm -hmm. just I, I don't want to i don't want to be upset at anybody and i don't want to attack anybody like verbally not attack but you know what i mean get into these like skirmishes with people and get really genuinely upset at them when you, mm -hmm. when, you when you like you know take the veil off and be like like acknowledge your ignorance acknowledge your racism like okay you're back <laughs> You were in such a, uh, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure what is happening with the internet, nor can I. Those are the keywords. It hears my keywords and it's going, yeah. okay, we're shut. Right yeah, down. nor do I have, <laughs> nor I have such little control over it too. I, I apologize. And no, it's, it's okay. It's, it's totally, totally fine. Yeah, I mean, and you know, it's such a, such a important conversation. And, you know, I, I think we're, and I'm glad that we're pointing to, a, what I what sounds like a like a similar um, um, commitment to thinking about care is considering you know um, care is being a deliberate decision. I mean, centered around collective well being, right? Not just like the well being of you know um, a chosen few or like uh, you know uh, 
the people who meet, you know, ideal beauty standards or standards or as or as or those who are as close to whiteness as possible. It's like just thinking about the collective, like really thinking about how we can um, take care of everyone, right? And and um, thinking through all of the complications attached to that. You know, I, of course, the pandemic has like made these conversations around who we care for, um, um, I guess, at the top of mind, I think. Um, yeah. You know, like we have in public discourse, like people uh, paying more attention to um, how we care for uh, people experiencing illness, like what sort of sick days people should be getting, like what sort of disability benefits people should be getting, you know, or like how work conditions are impacting health, you know, but this has always been the case for so many people, right? And, and you know, in many ways, the pandemic has exposed, you know, how there has been a lack of care for people, right? Oh, and, you know, like we're, we're talking about war now and like, like the, the explicit attention being paid to people in Ukraine, but it's also exposed our lack of care for other people, right? And um, yeah, so I think about healthcare, I think about labor, who's deemed essential or non-essential, who gets livable wages, all of these, all of these, you know, messy, messy things. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I completely agree with you on that. Um, yeah, and a, another question they posed to us is, how do you take care of the people around you while also practicing self-care? <sighs> the people around me. I am in a position that's a bit particular because the people who are physically around me and who have been physically around me, um, um, as hard as life has been here for uh, my community. Mm. Um, like we started the conversation saying that uh, I have people who are not in the immediate around me, but are around me and back home that uh, would, would almost, almost, you know, uh, kill themselves to have the inconveniences or the difficulties that we mm. have here. So, uh my care is very much uh directed in that direction you know it's mm -hmm. it's it's knowing that my my two old parents have an hour of electricity a day and have access mm -hmm. to 500 dollars a month from from the scumbags that are called banks uh, <laughs> to live off uh, uh thing and 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 you know my parents are old Der, and uh, need very little, but I'm thinking also of like the friends who are like uh, closer to my age and younger, who have uh, their own small families and have those insane worries. And then I'm thinking of like the couple of people who moved here, um, uh, two very dear friends who moved to Canada about a year ago, and the 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 the, the Oh my God, how to even fucking say this? This is just mm. so, I'm sorry, this is gonna get not very nice. Like the systemic racism that we mm. have so beyond even what I thought I understood. And basically a system that just puts its boot on people's necks and makes sure they remain in poverty because mm. of certain rules that make absolutely no sense. And them having to resort to just like terrible ways to make any money because the government will not allow them to earn any money because they come from a place where they have no access to their money. These are people that have savings all their lives they've worked for because of our stupid Ponzi scheme that is called capital <laughs> banks in the world. They have no access to this money and then they come to this, you know, developed, civilized first world. And of course they are treated like nothing but, you know, scammers and they have to spend about a year proving that they're not scamming anybody. If, if somebody is married to somebody, it is because, you know, they need, so much has to be done to prove to the stupid government that this is actually some <laughs> that somebody's doing this for true love and not for you know to scam the country and be on welfare and take you know privileged white people's money and their retirement funds and all this stuff it's just so unbelievably frustrating i just came back and i had to bring back a bag of medicine for a friend who uh, married a canadian and it's been 11 months he's been waiting for his papers he had to get medicine from a place like Lebanon, a place that is as like just non, not, 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 in, not in such a non-functional state. Mm. Get medicine from there that is probably expired to a certain degree, probably cheated, probably, I don't know what, but because he has absolutely no access in any way 
to medicine here because he has no status yet. He just has right. to really stay at home and wait and is not allowed to earn a penny because that would completely void his, his permanent residency application. Um, but somehow he's expected by the government to live and be, be contributing to society for 11 months, 12 months until the Canadian government deems that he's a human being. And until mm -hmm. then, just stay at home, do nothing. And he was just like, I'm out of my medication. And I was like, I'm going to Lebanon. He's like, my brother will give you medication. Please, can you bring it to me? And I was like, of course I will. And I brought it and I'm just like, I can't believe I'm bringing you medicine from Lebanon to Canada. That is just, how twisted is that? How absolutely mm -hmm. twisted is that? Mm -hmm. he said, literally, he's like, it's one twentieth the price. So that's all I can afford. And you're just like, oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, okay. just a reminder of the racism that right there is ingrained deeply, deeply, deeply ingrained systemic racism. Right, absolutely, and like an explicit reminder of of who gets cared for and who doesn't. Right, of course. Yeah, like because and who isn't. Yeah, and of course that shouldn't be the case, right? And so when we're thinking about collective well being, you know this this friend of yours hasn't been cared for and and so that's my when, when to answer your question it's like that's 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 i have to i'm a human and i have a very very <laughs> finite amount of care especially human with kids which means the majority of the kids so then right. it's just, you have to like just you know as bad as it gets here it's mm -hmm. okay for the majority of the people in my immediate circle i know right. you know right. and, and we have to have just different a different hierarchy of to, to what degree, how, how important someone's, we all have our micro crises on mm -hmm. a daily basis. And we have to just like put them in an order of like, what can I, as one single person, how much attention can I give to how many people to take care of how many crises? And mm -hmm. if we all do that, then we're all okay. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's nice that you brought up your kid because that, rem or your, your children, because that reminds me of um, how I, you know, have been thinking about um, how to take care of people. And, and while my perspective is differently oriented from like a different history, of course, um, maybe I'll just share like a lesson that my son <laughs> bestowed upon me recently because I witnessed my four-year-old uh, son named Asa. I witnessed him soothe his classmate um, who was crying because uh, this child was refusing to leave the daycare parking lot with his grandparents. and. So Asa went over to help this child. Um, Asa held this child's hand and walked him slowly to the car. And, and he knew he was doing something that was kind, right? And, oh. and he, he knew that he was putting the feelings of someone else before his. Mm -hmm. And I was so moved by this moment um, because it charged me with a feeling of hope and, you know, uh, charged me with a feeling of, you know, like possibility. And when, when Asa and I finally got to our own car, I, I looked at him and I said, doesn't it feel good to be kind to others? And he like emphatically said, yes. So I guess that's how I, that's how I imagine taking care of people around me is like the core, like being as mindful of what someone might need and, and being kind when it is needed. Um, um, and yeah, a, a lesson that I think, or, or uh, yeah, a lesson that I think is at the root of like what we're talking about, like, um, you know, kindness, how can we be more kind to each other? And, you know, I mean, to be honest, I'm not sure if I've been the best at being kind to myself during pandemic, you know, you know, uh, taking into consideration the second part of this question where they've asked us to talk about self-care. Um, but, you know, uh, because I think it's always a work in progress. Um, but um, yeah, like, a, so maybe, maybe you can talk about like um, how you've taken care of yourself uh, and how the pandemic has impacted your practice as an artist and if these things are entangled in any way? Um, Self-care. I don't <laughs> know that I don't have a way. I, I, I don't think it's something that I think about and it's not like mm -hmm. a, I'm not aware and conscious of it. Self-care. I don't know what self-care means. I mean, I am generally speaking a person that's like 95% of the time content and happy and I'm just, you know, just always am i'm like you know rarely in a bad mood like we all get in bad moods but really am i like in a like prolonged kind of bad down state um and when the pandemic started when this pandemic mm -hmm. started um i did feel a bit inhuman and i did feel like i had to question my degree of 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 
like my my empathy because I think a lot of people around me saw me as someone who kind of didn't care so much about it and uh, because I didn't give it that much space in my head to me I was just like it didn't make me anxious I, my experience with the very initial stages of the pandemic also were extreme they were like the most extreme anybody I know in my community <laughs> I, March 2020 I was mid-tour in Europe I was in uh. Spain when just everything just went poof, we basically got the news that you have eight hours to get out of Europe and right. Canada was starting to threaten closing the borders for anybody flying in, anybody going out, anybody coming in. And we were like, oh, I guess tour's over. <laughs> we got to go home. And then we were like, just, it was like, we were stuck for six days in Europe, mm-hmm. seven days in Europe, five of those in an airport hotel waiting for a plane that would take us back home. Wow. And everybody freaking out here and me being like, it's okay. It's not the end of the world. It is. And if it is, it's the end of the world. There's nothing any one of us can do about it. I don't know. <laughs> just that's how my brain goes to I go into like this management crisis management mode and I'm like I just I accept that this is what's happening and then we came to Montreal and of course the sh- you know shit hit the fan and we were under you know the infamous Quebecois crazy lockdowns and curfews and I just like took a conscious decision to be like well this is just not going to control me I'm sorry mm. I'm, I'm no asshole in a suit is going to fucking dictate how how life goes you clearly have demonstrated time and time again you do not know what you're doing and mm-hmm. why the hell would I trust a just an inherently racist institution like you to fucking tell me that you know what's best for me. And I just, just became like this, I'm just gonna be careful and gonna use, make my own decisions about how that, to protect everybody around me, but I, I modify my life and adjust it to continue doing what I need to do to remain sane. And um, so I, I did, I think, so that in a way is self-care, I guess, in a way. Mm-hmm. I, did, I did continue going to my own little studio, worked alone. For that first six month stretch, a lot of people forget that we were in a six month curfew lockdown here. Yes. Yeah. It was out that like really the damage that that did to people. That is unforgivable. That is, if there's a crime, that's the crime right there. It's like mm. the damage that it did. And my partner and I talked about our children. It was like, do we want our children to understand that this is what life is? Because this was two years ago. So my daughter was one and my son was three. You know, like, do we want them to understand that this is what a human human life is, a human existence and human interaction mm. is? Um, so yeah, we had to like, you know, take, like think about it long, deep and hard and be like, these are the decisions we're gonna make and this is what we're gonna do. And yeah, we adjusted our life of course and kept it extremely safe, but also did not go down the, 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 the path that, that quite a few of my friends went down, which was hyper paranoia, hyper mm-hmm. distress. And as soon as you started seeing where, you know, here in, in Quebec, where they were really encouraging people to rat on people, to tell, to call the police, to tell the cops if somebody has somebody over in their house, if somebody's having somebody in their backyard. We once mm-hmm. went to a park, us in like our like community of like Lebanese uh, friends who have kids who are kind of a similar age. We went to uh, the, the big main central park here. We were all hanging out. This was like summer 2020. So, and we were all like kept the, the two meter distance, like that is science. And mm-hmm. then we got, a cop came up to us and said, they've had four complaints from people in the park saying that our children are not maintaining, our one-year-olds and three-year-olds were not maintaining the two meter required distance and that's making them uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And you were just like, at that point, you were like, yeah, this is, this is, this is just the beginning. This is just the tip of yeah. the where this is headed. And this just, you know, to me, it was just yeah. so dark, so scary. And you were like, yeah, no, sorry, not for me. This is not, this is not the world I'm gonna live in. Sorry. Yeah. And we just told the cops, well, go talk to the kids they're all yours you want to arrest them go <laughs> go arrest the kids you know right. the cop was like the cop was embarrassed even he was like embarrassed and we're like well what do you want me to do what do you want me to tell the one-year-old you go mm-hmm. talk to the 14 month old and tell them no they have to maintain a two meter distance when they're walking around a park like a giant mm-hmm. open air but it's just was just like oh my god all of you people get just like you're that uncomfortable what are you doing in a park <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, there was a way in which, like, there was this, like, securing of the surveillance state, right? <laughs> like, you know, you're talking about this, like, policing of kids in parks, like, like, I, I, an extension of that is like, yeah, there was, like, even more surveillance on, on people who are already so surveilled, right? Right. Of course, of course, of course, we, of course, we went up to a cottage at one point in, in, in the thick of, like, the, uh, the, the, the curfew. Mm-hmm. and other friends and uh this was yet another lebanese person who had yet was still waiting on their papers another one of the people that f- uh, had fled lebanon post, post the explosion post the collapse 
And they were just mortified to be at this chalet and wanted to hide the car that they were in, like in the woods, because they were really worried about a neighbor calling the cops because they didn't have their papers and they could, this could completely jeopardize their whole right. application for being in Canada because they're breaking the, 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 that they are not in their house at home, that they're in a cottage and that we are two families and that we're not related and that we're mm-hmm. sharing space. And I was just like, oh my God, when they get in your head, they really get in your head. Huh? Like they, they totally. have to scare the living shit out of us. And they do do it when they can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> on this topic of self-care, I was thinking about how like in my like scrolling of social media, which of course was, was, um, uh, you know, became more because of the pandemic. Like I started to see so many like postings about fitness and about, you know, healthy eating and about like this industry of self-care that you know like proposed this like neoliberal model of care right that can like somehow conflated morals or morality with self-management or this idea of uh, treating oneself or staying fit right or getting closer to impossible beauty standards and you know you know I, I started to think about like what sort of histories feminist histories in particular get erased by this idea of self-care because self-care has a history, like has a feminist history of struggle and organizing where self-care was so integral to larger goals of collective care. Like, Mm -hmm. for example, like practitioners, like therapists dealing with patients who experience trauma, like insisted on caring for themselves in order to better care for their patients, right? Or, or, you know, um, self-care is important to the work of caregiving, you know, like physical health was so important and imperative during the women's movement, during the civil rights movement of the 60s and 70s, because people needed to stay healthy so that they could, along with their allies, challenge racism and sexism and colonialism and patriarchy and all of these things that, you know, self-care was so deeply connected to collective care. But now self-care is like this industry where this rhetoric around care is more individualized. Absolutely. And I think this, you know, like this, 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 you know, feminist history of struggle gets erased and completely just evaporates it's like it never evaporates yeah it turns into something completely different turns into a hashtag or a new product that encourages like a six-pack or or like beautiful skin routines and you know or you know it gets uh you know conflated or this idea of self-care gets conflated with this idea of or this notion of freedom right um which in this moment of pandemic has become like so messy and you know, freedom has become this um, very individualized thing and, and is not about collective health or well-being by any means. And so it's just like, it gets, it gets very, uh, I guess, frustrating. It's, a, it's such a dangerous word even right now, like literally in Canada to say that word. I right now. know. Like, say the word freedom and you're like, oh, oh, back right. you sketch, I'm sketched. Like, <laughs> yeah. What do you mean? Which freedom? I know. Right? Yeah, who's freedom? <laughs> Yeah. What do you, what do you, yeah. Whose freedom are you talking about? Are you really free right now? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just, it became so, so absurd. So, 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 so absurd. Yeah, you want to laugh. Right. It's like when I went, got to Beirut and my father was like, so, you know, he's like, well, what the fuck is this deal with these guys in their trucks? And I was just like, you know what? It's literally that. <laughs> it's just those guys in their trucks. He's like, right. that's it. I was like, basically, yes. <laughs> basically yeah. the core of it is, Yes. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it, Dad. I really do not know what to tell you about it because I and you, they're, they know what it's about, I think. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's just for such, sure. anyway, it's just, yeah. And that's that word freedom. And he was just like, what freedom? I don't get it. What are they not? It's like, <laughs> what, is there no electricity there? I was like, no, no, there's, there's electricity. Yeah. And there's electricity in the cars. And like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and the $150,000, yeah, pickup. Yeah. The- electricity yeah. definitely in that hundred and fifty thousand dollar pickup truck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean I, I'm sure we could keep talking about that for hours and hours. Oh. But yeah. Um I, I, another question they have for us is that what else keeps us inspired? Like what ke- what kept you inspired during lockdown? Like what kept you creative, cre- creatively inspired during lockdown? I was. Um uh, we're, we're, well, okay. <laughs> Let's not be crass here. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say, we're talking about stuff. <laughs> uh, I, I, I had planned on uh, uh, spring 2020 
onwards, I had planned to start working on a new album. So when I came back and we were in this lockdown and I maintained going to my studio and working, it just, you know, was kind of in a way, um, didn't, didn't, it didn't hinder anything. Uh, mm -hmm. It actually helped because all of a sudden I had every single night of the week to go out and work and I did not, I didn't respect the curfew. Mm -hmm. My studio is a hundred meters from my house. So I would mm -hmm. go out from the alley, walk down the mm -hmm. alley, the space and go up the alley and basically I was never on the street um, mm -hmm. and I was working alone in my little rehearsal studio and so I was like you know of course I was respecting that curfew in the sense that I wasn't going anywhere I was just going to my rehearsal space but it, it definitely did not did not I was I remained creative and remained working and a lot of my friends almost all of my friends who are musicians really started getting uh, uh, panic attacks and anxiety attacks about our future mm -hmm. I just uh, kept kept uh, reassuring them without any knowledge or data or any information other than being like, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. it'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You really don't have it that bad. It's okay. Stop, stop worrying about your art, your art. If, if you cannot travel to take a plane and travel to Europe to present your work, it does not mean your work cannot exist or it doesn't mean your work isn't valid. If that's what validates your work, you should rethink about what your work means and what it mm -hmm. is. So let's all just take it easy. We should just like thank our lucky stars that all of us are not sick and none of us are dying of COVID. There are a lot of people dying and we are not. So keep mm -hmm. that in mind. Keep that in mind when you're worrying about your practice and worry about your practice, but don't make that be like. The everything. The everything that, 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 who am I and why am I not being heard and what am I, what, what do I do to remain, to remain uh, inspired? Uh, I definitely mm -hmm. was not, not inspired. I'm always inspired. That's just me. That's my nature. So um, mm -hmm. I just kept, kept, kept working at it and, and tried to be a, you know, uh, took the opportunity to be closer to my children, be more, mm -hmm. more present as a parent because of our crazy schedules means we travel a lot and mm -hmm. and so that was great that felt really good and that that was definitely kept kept me going in, in, in many ways uh, again as cheesy as it sounds to be like well, my kids really inspired me well they did actually mm -hmm. um so for me it was that and also just maintaining kind of keep keeping keeping touch with everybody and just you know keeping your like finger on the pulse like knowing what everybody's doing what's going on with everyone and just like take that time to like you know work on these things that you just have never have time to work on them watched a lot of cinema didn't read a whole lot read so little mm -hmm. <laughs> it's terrible did watch an ocean a boatload of cinema which was great mm -hmm. for me it's inspirational it's really the, the the medium that that i go to for inspiration um mm -hmm. so yeah it, it was it was uh, I, I tried to just what I normally do, I kept, I tried to maintain that, I tried to keep that normal uh, way of living. Mm -hmm. Cooked a lot, of course, which is my biggest passion in life is just making food. Um, oh, so yeah. that's, that, that's um, just cooking and cooking and cooking and cooking and cooking. That sounds, yeah, I mean, that sounds really nice. And cooking food, of course. Yeah. And I, fast, I, I wanted to avoid going down the black hole of drinking every night and going down. Right. So I just decided that I would fast every single day, like 5, oh, wow. 5 p.m. onwards. I just do not eat until the next the next uh, breakfast, just right. to avoid. So there's no alcohol at night, and that way we we just eliminate that going down, yep. going down that black hole of that over, rabbit hole. All of a sudden, yeah, rabbit hole. I, I, like all of a sudden, you're just you're just an alcoholic, and you didn't even realize right. it. Happened. And For so sure. I was really really aware of that. And I was like, knowing me and my personality, it's like very easily you can go down there. So let's not yeah. let's just eliminate that immediately. Yeah, I mean that's yeah, yeah, becoming that's, a, a drunk, but <laughs> I, would, <laughs> I would like have a bottle of wine by like three p.m. It's like a bottle of wine gone. <laughs> right, right. I mean, bottles of wine are so good. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, for me, I I was caring for like a two-year-old at the time, and I was finishing my PhD dissertation, and then uh, I was prepared. <laughs> Uh, and then was preparing for a, a job interview at the job that I have now at York University. So like, I didn't have very much time for music, but I did think that like, there was some creativity involved in surviving <laughs> everything at once, like, like the creative practice of surviving all of the, like extreme duress and, and uncertainty in this moment was, you know, something that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super uh, proud of, but, you know, I, I was surrounded by peers and and people in the academic world and friends who play music uh, and friends who continue to organize uh, for you know, goals of, so of social justice and artists who are oriented towards providing re reprieve, um, joy, pleasure for their audiences through um, art and creating aesthetic experiences like these people inspired yeah. me, um, of course. And I mean, I, I, I admit, I, I watched an interview 
you gave to a reporter uh, who was covering um, the La Guess Who music festival in the Netherlands, a, a really lovely music festival. And, and you briefly talked about um, what appeals you to music. And you said something like, like you don't like art that you don't understand. Um, and you like when music allows its audience to like connect their own dots and make their own story from what they are experiencing. And, and oh, what I took- I Music I don't understand. You don't understand. You said yes. that, yes. I do like stuff I do not understand. I'm sorry. You do not understand it. And you said that you like, um, sorry, I'm just recalling this right now. Um, you spoke about the capacity of music to enchant. And I like love this idea of, of music as a site of enchantment and like art as producing enchantment. And, yes. and, and during the lockdown, it was certainly music and film and television that offered me like this, this yeah. reprieve through fantasy and yeah. through enchantment. So like I definitely turned to the arts and yeah. aesthetic experience as a way to feel creatively inspired. Yeah. Did, did you work on anything in these last two years that you produced and like put out in the world that was sort of, was born not out of the pandemic, but during the pandemic, just be it related or, or by coincidence? Did that, I'm so interested about what people have been doing for the last two years, you know? Very, very yeah, cool. yeah. I mean, the the thing is, is that I started a new job um, in the summer of like when the p- pandemic, July of two thousand twenty, and yeah. so I was just rammed with like the new responsibilities that came with having a new job, and so you know, like wrote some articles and and you know, created classes, which to me like felt so deeply connected to my creative practice as a musician. And and then like, this is not like me, like trying to like find an easy cop out for not producing music, but this is me like not privileging music as the only site of creation that means something, right? And so like, to me, like making lectures and classes for students who at York University where I work, there's a lot of racialized students, a lot of first time, um, you know, um, students uh, who are attending university for the first time rather. And I like just love, I love making or thinking about how to teach in a way that is not just like talking at them, like integrating different art, different music, different like mediums as a way of teaching about injustice, right? Like this is my teaching practice is based on like trying to teach lessons on equity and social justice and things like that. So. I mean, yeah, I, I didn't make it an album, but you know, I certainly produced other things that felt really which, meaningful to me. Which is yeah. equally, if not more important, in my opinion. I mean, how it's, about you? You you said you're working on an album. I did, and and I did I did finish it. It just sadly gets labeled a pandemic album because it happened during the pandemic. Oh, and really? A lot of collaborators and. Everybody assumes that like, oh, because we were in lockdown, everybody was collaborating online. I was like, that was the idea way before COVID-19 was living. <laughs> so the coincidence of it is kind of funny. So I use the word coincidence because a lot of people, like a lot of interviews are like, so tell us about your pandemic album. It's like, it's not a pandemic. Stop calling it that. That's so gross. Right. It's, it's, just, right. it's, it's just a piece of work. And that's that. It happened during it, the pandemic. That's and it right. happened during the pandemic. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I guess that that is a nice segue into like, we have like a couple more questions before um, this conversation ends. But um, another question was, has caring for yourself and or others been reflected in your artistic practice? And what does it look, sound and feel like um, to oh, you? Yeah, actually, uh, the, the, uh, the record I had made uh, mm-hmm. is, is called the uh, Qalaq which in Arabic means worry, a deep worry. Mm. The album is very much uh, a, 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 it's reflecting on the, 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 the little, the literal explosion, literal explosion of, of, of Beirut, my hometown. Mm. And uh, the, to me, it was like the, it was the, it's a, it, it's a, from my end, it's a big sentiment of caring about that, like, and, and just really like trying to make sense and trying to, you know, sort of give a fuck about, about, about that. So that to me, again, it's not pandemic related. It just happened during the pandemic, but the whole record is an ode to that, to that, that feeling of like, 
I care so much and I'm so helpless and I do not know how to feel and or mm. what to do about it other than make work. Um, and so, yeah, there were definitely, that, that's how it, it manifested itself. But again, not, not COVID related. It was more that it happened during a COVID. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, for me, my work, I always feel is, 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 is generous in, in, uh, in, oh my God, so difficult to put words to this. It's very like, I try, I try my best to be generous with the emotions and to really, mm -hmm when an audience member experiences it, that they are, they feel included and not excluded from mm -hmm. what is happening within the performance. It's mm -hmm. not a thing where you, even though the, the, the content is entirely in Arabic and I know 99.9% .9 of the time I'm performing this to people who do not speak the language and I, I, I refuse to offer translations. I don't like that. I think it's just ridiculous that people expect that here. Um, and for me, it's just more like providing a space where people can feel just included and not like you're not a spectator, you are a participant. You are not here mm -hmm. as an audience, you're here as a, as a person that is just walking into an experience and hopefully will mm -hmm. walk out with something that you will leave a bit richer than you came in, but you mm -hmm. leave something and you came in without that something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like this idea of providing an experience that someone can participate in and yeah. um it's a nice way to think about the ways in which we can create these like musical experiences are that are not just musical but that can hopefully touch on different you know emotional psychic um sonic yeah, levels absolutely absolutely and the, the 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 last like the 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 new version of the show that that i perform mm -hmm. <clears throat> a lot of the visuals are um collaborated with a dear friend who was one of the people who escaped Lebanon who's a photographer and took so documented uh, two two people actually they documented two aspects of the the, the catastrophes of Lebanon one being the the uh, sort of the collapse of the government and one being the actual physical collapse of the city <laughs> and uh, the show is very um, the, the visual super rapid fire super kind of intense um, opening of the show is is these images and when uh, we presented the show last November in Montreal. Of course, there's a lot of Lebanese people here and a mm. lot of acquaintances and friends were there. And definitely there was a lot of tears in the audience. And that was a bit difficult for me, a bit problematic, especially because there was a handful of people who were there when the blast happened, including my sister. And yeah. definitely, uh, yeah, left some people, you know, a little bit messed up, a little bit somewhat triggered by it, of course. Mm -hmm. um, without that under with them understanding that is absolutely not the intention but yeah it's like uh, it's 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 you hope that the canadians that were in the room walk away with some sort of understanding of something like you don't have to understand it in words you have to just understand it in feeling uh, and in, in sentiment and emotion and that to me is generosity that you are mm -hmm. able to you as somebody so removed from anything without understanding anything about any of that conflict can walk away from this show being like, I can empathize. I have empathy now, even though I don't necessarily understand, I have empathy and that is the most human thing you can do. Mm -hmm. That's like the common language that like binds us all. Empathy, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a really lovely sentiment. I, I mean, and I would love, I would, I would love to experience your your music when, when, when that opportunity ever presents itself to me. Um, and I would love to meet you in person one day. <laughs> yeah, Toronto is not yeah. in my future. <laughs> I mean, that's okay. <laughs> it's dark and dreary here. <laughs> I, I, you know, in my experience as a as a musician. Um, I guess I've always tried to be mindful of my collaborators' needs if we're talking about like how we care for others and what we do in our artistic practice. Um, I've, I've always tried to be mindful of feelings and you know uh, the, the unique positionalities that each of my like collaborator collaborators brings to like a musical s setting. You know, I've, I've always tried to articulate that anything that I've created is a collective effort and that that is also remunerated in a way at that to properly reflect that. Um, I also think that um, you know prioritizing care in musical settings to me means organizers are always organizers and artists are always anticipating yeah. what might make someone feel uncomfortable or unsafe. You know, like 
what does the lineup look like? What sort of audience are you attracting? Will that audience make anyone feel more vulnerable or unwelcomed? You know, are people being paid fairly? Are the people working in the venues that host events being treated respectfully? Like, are there like assholes leaving like, you know, messes in the bathrooms in ways that are like disrespectful to those who um, um, perform labor there? So there's a lot of ways in which um, people who play music in you know, this place we call Canada <laughs> can think about how to extend capacities of care um, towards others. So it's very difficult for me to we constantly have this discussion and this kind of uh, disagreement with my uh, uh, North American booking agent and manager who mm. both, uh, you know, always, not always, they both like the idea of uh, presenting your art to, you know, a, 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 an audience here as opposed to constantly being a project that exists more in Europe than here mm -hmm. and I always you know always uh, uh, you know tell them both that they are not touring musicians or you know traveling musicians uh, or traveling artists and for me the, the generally speaking the experience here is one of yes a lot of the spaces that would host us end up being so hostile Mm. so aggressive so uh so um just wrong on so many levels like you know just unaccommodating on any level and unwilling to sort of engage with the artist and the art the, art, the work that they're doing and also providing a space that's kind of hostile you know mm -hmm. yeah, like i don't play bars i don't perform kind of these kinds of venues like that just like do not interest me where just like you have like bar staff that are just like you know have the shittiest job and they have to clean these filthy fucking math bathrooms because like assholes are leaving messes in them that just like these just people that just have don't think beyond the immediate need and the immediate here and now and just have no care or no concept of like communal space uh mm. sharing sharing a a uh, a yeah having like a community in a space and providing this 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 uh space for people to come work present engage and then move on and, and keep this be a, 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 a very safe space, like a truly safe space for, for people versus going to a, a dungeon downtown that's just disgusting and filthy. And it's mm -hmm. just like big and human beings that are there to protect you from yourself. <laughs> it's just like, it's just like, it's all like, how is this enjoyable to anybody? I don't understand why any human would want to even set foot in your stupid little hole. It's like, <laughs> I would, how is this even interesting to anybody? I don't understand. <laughs> So yeah, not a very popular opinion I have, but. No, I think that it's important to be able to draw those boundaries, right? Like, and maybe it's sort of like, for me, I found that so difficult to do when I was younger. Like I was like, oh, people are doing me a favor by letting me play in their venues. Like letting me be a part of their show. It's, it's like it's ingrained in you, that idea that, yeah. that, that you, you should, you should be, you should like count your lucky stars that yeah. you're gonna play fucking asshole shitheads fucking rock venue. It's like, like yeah. somehow, you know, and you're like, you know what, if it wasn't for us, you would be out of work pretty quick. You yeah. know, it's like, yeah. you, you, we're just like the logs that you just throw into your stupid fucking steam engine and to keep your engine going, but it doesn't matter because well, you, you can afford to throw out one log, but if all the logs say like, well, fuck you and your space. <laughs> you know? Then that and space goes away. <laughs> it goes away. And a lot of, a lot of, a lot of artists don't understand that, that, that is that the democratic power that, 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 that mm. we, we as artists have, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But because we're still kept on, we kept on such a tight financial leash, you know, such a tight financial leash that we're just like anything that it's so hard to say no to something and you will, mm -hmm. you will compromise and you will compromise your comfort, belief, you know, you'll just so many, so much compromise happens just so you can just be like, well, I just need to exist, you know, I need to have mm -hmm. the opportunity to exist. And that's just unfair. This is really, mm -hmm. really, really unfair. Yeah, totally. Okay, well, maybe like we can end with the last question, which which you know um, ends with um, thinking about how we've felt cared for during the pandemic. So, have you felt cared for? How have you felt cared for during the pandemic? Uh, I think I um, tend to be one of those people that always runs around worrying about others. Mm. And whenever asked, I'm always like, yeah, yeah, don't worry about me. Don't worry, I'm always fine because I always feel I'm always fine. And again, it just goes with my attitude of, I always think everything's fine. And, you know, uh, I definitely am surrounded by, you know, some of the best people in the world, in my world. 
So mm -hmm. I always feel like, you know, all I need to say is ouch and 50 people will run, run to help. So I never feel, I never feel there's a lack of uh, love, affection and care for me. Uh, mm -hmm. Even though I'm not the type of person that asks for it, I know it's there for me to, to have if I need it. So it's, 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 I just feel very lucky. I'm very, mm -hmm. very lucky surrounded by so many amazing human beings all the time i mean that's similar to me like i've definitely felt cared for and continue to be cared for by my partner you know we've done our best to equally divide parenting responsibilities um you know i feel cared for by my child who continues to feel fill me with hope and laughter you know my family members have cared for me during the pandemic and, and you know i've felt very cared for by a close-knit a close-knit circle of friends you know um, after the Atlanta shootings in March, 2021, where um, if you don't remember, uh, uh, women of Asian descent were targeted and, and killed, you know, amidst a growing anti-Asian sentiment, you know, we started a text thread um, where we could, uh, where Asian identified women rather, um, members of my family and friends where we could share, you know, distress, grief and sadness. And, and this felt like a really important space um, where I felt cared for by other women who've also um, encountered this like very specific experience of anti-Asian racism that like doesn't go away. Like as we're discussing now when headlines change, you know, it's it's a thick sticky residue um, that, that uh, lingers and is sometimes difficult to deal with. Um, but, you know, you know, um, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, it's nice. Flash. The news flash to people is that like, yeah, this didn't exist because it caught your attention and it's sad that it took this shooting for you to fucking even recognize that there's a problem. Right, yeah. absolutely. Like, welcome, absolutely. Welcome, welcome to like so many people's lives every day, their entire life. Right, yeah. I mean, yeah, like the planet continues to be in peril. There are, yeah. there are wars being played out in multiple places, enacting mass devastation. You know, racial justice persists. Black people continue to be killed at the hands of police. Asian women continue, continue to be targeted by gendered violence. Um, I don't know. In Texas, cruelty is being legislated, you know, with the governor, Greg Abbott, ordering that Texas Department, the, the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services investigate parents of transgender kids for child abuse. You know, this is certainly a time like for worry, but also a time to extend our capacities and potential solidarities, right? Absolutely. To combat, to combat these violences where we can. So Absolutely. yeah, I, you know, I feel like I've made a friend. So, you know, hopefully we can stay in touch. And it was such a lovely um, conversation to share with you and Thank again you so I apologize much. I apologize about the internet and <laughs> don't apologize about the internet it's not your fault <laughs> yeah. I apologize on behalf of the internet <laughs> you really, you um, really suck <laughs> you really suck you're very uncaring you're uncaring uh, um, we hope yeah. we get to uh, uh, be in a room soon together maybe our children can sit there and, and play have very fun times together. If ever you're yeah. in Montreal, please, 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 please reach out. And if I am in Toronto, I promise I will reach out. Might happen sooner than later. My partner's family lives in Alora. Part of her family live ah. in Alora. So we okay. kind of go to Toronto to, uh, to, to, to get to Alora. Amazing. Um, well, you, we'll be sure to have a, a warm meal uh, for you guys to have whenever but you're, the, whenever wait. you're in the, in the area. Promise I'll be in touch. Yeah. And uh, please, I would, I would, if any work you have, you would love to share. I would love to oh. read, listen, see anything. I will do the same. I will send you a, uh, a download code. Yes, I will ask. Yeah, the, please the, do. The, send it to you if you want to listen to this last record. We're talking I about. will pay for it. I will pay for it. No, it's no, part no. of the, it's part of the interaction. <laughs> yes, it really, I just would love you to have it. That's all. Um, but I will, I will send you that by email uh, right away. Okay. Well, nice Great. to talk to you. Nice talking to you too. Take care. Bye.